All right. So next up is Bernie uh, Bailey and me. We're going to talk a little bit about the uh, Getting Started Guides, the resources that we've been developing as part of the CDCG project. Um, so um, as a reminder from this morning, this gap that we were talking about, right, there's been a lot of activity uh, in this space. Uh, there are a lot of uh, viable applications, models, standards, all these different things, right, resources that people can rely on, but they're not necessarily being incorporated or even things that people in a lot of institutions are aware of. Uh, so the Closing the Digital Curation Gap, again, um, as a project, um, started a few years ago and it's wrapping up now just this spring. Um, you've already heard about the partners and the main goals, basically to establish this kind of community resource and also to bring people together around the activities such as this event. Um, the approaches and methods, uh, we've engaged in a variety of uh, data collection and analysis mm -hmm. approaches throughout the project. Uh, we've done interviews, focus groups, um, survey. Um, I'll say as some background, initially we had planned to do much more extensive surveys and then discovered because um, this was not a grant from IMLS, but actually a partnership between JISC and IMLS, is the Office of Management and Budget has to approve anything that constitutes a survey if it involves more than, what is it, nine individuals. Um, and that clearly wasn't going to fit into the timeline of our project, so we shifted pretty heavily for reasons that actually became very clear in retrospect, um, to focus more heavily on focus groups, um, where we found out a lot from people about what their sort of needs and expectations were, and also what kind of resources they were relying on. Um, so the various products that we've been working on have been grounded in these experiences we've had in um, gaining the, the, the data from these different sources and also working with collecting institutions as part of the project. Uh, so we've also drawn from a lot of previous studies in what people have already identified. Clearly we're not the first ones to be looking at these issues of what are the needs of the professionals. So in particular, um, uh, materials generated by the NEDCC and Cornell University Library um, the focus groups, as I mentioned, we had four groups, 25 participants, and we wanted to get the full coverage of library archives and museums, so we went to conferences for librarians, for archivists, and for museum professionals. Right? MCN is Museum Computer Network. Um, and uh, the participant recruitment was directed toward people who were basically in this space between, um, you know, rocket scientists, whatever that is, right? <laughs> and people who really didn't have enough familiarity to even be conversant. So what we did is, identify people who'd already gone through some training. So they'd already gone through the professional institute that we held, they went through the uh, digital excuse me, the digital preservation management workshop, a number of different training uh, endeavors that then we use that as our selection to think that, you know, they might really be struggling in their institutions, but at least they have some of the language and be able to convey some of the things about what their needs were. Uh, so the focus groups, what we focused on were what kinds of digital curation activities do they currently practice? Uh, for those activities, what tools and resources did they use? How did they feel about the tools and resources? What other types would they like to have? And we basically worked through these high-level functions of, you know, getting stuff, appraising it, putting it into storage, and worked through this table, basically, where we said, okay, you know, how do you approach that? What resources do you rely on? What other resources would you like to have? And basically, we initially presented them with this thing we were calling this decision tree, um, and determined through basically this whole process that something much more like the Getting Started Guides that we developed would be a better approach. Uh, so we decided that really the entree into these resources should be common scenarios that people tend to convey to us as the point where they hit a brick wall, right? It's not just the day-to-day, -day, you know, how do I do what I'm doing a little bit better. It's suddenly, I don't even know where to start. I don't know what questions to ask. I don't know what rely, resources to rely on, right? And the ones that really kept coming through to us based on interviews, based on focus groups, were acquiring information off external storage media, so that's, you know, I've got disks, what do I do with them? Um, analyzing digital creation costs, that's one that's been added quite recently to this whole endeavor. Archiving websites, um, building institutional repositories, so that's certainly a very common one of, hey, look, now I'm responsible for this institutional repository. What does that mean? How do I get started, right? Um, caring for digitized collections, uh, managing data as opposed to text-based materials, right? So librarians, archivists, who are now supposed to be data people and thinking, well, what are data sets? You know, how do I deal with databases and data models and all these kinds of things? And then caring for audiovisual materials. Uh, so the Getting Started Guides, which Courtney's gonna tell you more about, and she's done a great deal of the work in putting them together and formatting them and, and coordinating all this activity. They're intended to provide directed pointers and prods for action. They're not intended to be things like, for example, the DCC has some very rich resources that are lengthier documents, right? There are reports from CLEAR. 
on how to do something or think about a particular area of activity. We're trying to give people products to go off and find more resources, take another workshop, watch a video, whatever it might be, right? Rather than being the definitive guide to how to archive websites or something. Um, it's built in the Digital Curation Exchange, which is this um, Drupal-based environment. Um, and the high-level organization is, again, based on those scenarios that I just presented. Uh, so the Digital Curation Exchange has been in development since 2008. It was initiated by um, work that was funded through um, through the IMLS, both DigiSeeker 1 and 2 projects and the CDCG. I wanted to acknowledge um, Heather Bowden, who uh, did a lot of the work in, it was sort of a group endeavor to conceptualize the first space, but she's done the majority of the work in designing it and maintaining it and really making sure that it's the kind of environment that it is now. Um, so the architecture and main features is based on Drupal. This is DCE, I'm saying. Uh, users can view public uh, portions anonymously. They can create an account and get into different spaces. They can create groups and share information that only people in that group can get access to. Uh, there are a variety of content types in the Digital Curation Exchange. The Q&A section is one that hasn't been as active as we might have anticipated, but a lot of other areas have been very active. Uh, and posts can be either a blog where you just put it up there and people can comment, or it can be wiki where people can actually do a blog that thing. So this is the Digital Curation Exchange here. Take all the URL to put you to it. I think join button. So if you go there, you can join and create an account. It's quick and easy. Um, so I'm going to transition over to Courtney, who's going to tell you more specifically about the guides that we're developing. So these should look somewhat familiar. We've heard from several sources already, um, most recently, I think, from George, about a number of these uh, ideas around which we organize these guides. Um, so as we have put the asterisk here, there are two of these that we added. Um, so in addition to the six that the Library of Congress DPOE program came up with, we also added the idea of prepare, um, which is fairly self-evident what we mean by that. Uh, but it's basically trying to get people to, to think a little bit before you start doing stuff. So the whole premise behind this is that you need to start doing stuff, but you do need to think a little bit before you start that. Um, so that's, that's the principle of, of what we're doing with the prepare part. Um, George walked us through most of this. I would add a few things in terms of how we sort of modify, I guess, how we interpreted these verbs. Um, but identify, we also put in, in there things about characterizing materials or assessing risk. Um, with selecting, we are thinking not only about what should be kept, but also for how long and where. Um, get them is obviously another one of the ones that we added. And so um, you'll see in, in just a second when we look at the various um, guides what that means in, in different ones, but obviously that's the, the process of, of acquiring the materials that we're going to curate. Um, store and protect uh, and manage are, are very similar to what we've already heard from, uh, from George. And then provide, we also think of that not only in terms of user access, but also we wrap the copyright issue into that um, combined. So once you get into the Digital Curation Exchange, this is the uh, homepage for the Closing the Digital Curation Gap. And uh, this group page goes back to a lot of what Cal went over with us this morning about kind of the theory behind this in terms of digital curation and, and pulling a lot from uh, just in the DCC in terms of thinking about what that term means and, and why it's important. And uh, when I was brought on board last year, kind of, Two of the main things that I saw myself doing, one was to help kind of standardize these guides and embellish them where it was needed, but also to, to try to figure out what can we do that's different from what's already out there. How are we not just uh, be um, repetitive with the switches that are already available? So as you see the uh, red arrow here, one of the things that we have added are these video vignettes. Uh, and what we have done is to interview a number of professionals in, in various um, capacities. So some are in some are working in archives, some are working in libraries, but we tried to get a diversity of people involved in this. And then we sort of had a, a core group of questions that we asked them, and then a lot of times it kind of um, spun beyond that. Uh, but basically we wanted to get them to provide some feedback about if you were talking to someone who is getting started in this field, what suggestions do you want to have for them? Uh, what kinds of resources can you uh, suggest that would be helpful in getting started in this uh, what are some of the challenges that you're going to face so that you kind of know what you're getting into if you're, if you're new to the field? Um, and then also ask the people, what do you like about this? You know, so it, recognizing that there are going to be challenges, there are going to be problems, why is it still worth it? Um, so those are kind of the four core questions that you'll, you'll hear and see a lot of these people responding to. Um, and then like I said, sometimes we get a lot of other little pearls of wisdom as 
well, but um, I thought that was a valuable thing that, that we could offer this. Um, and we, we collected them here on this one page, and then we're also um, putting them into the individual guides as well. So lots of ways you can access them. Um, that. Uh, if you look back here, let me call your attention to the navigation here on the left-hand side. <coughs> so there are a number of ways that you can get through this site. Uh, this is showing sort of the top level nav navigation of these digital curation guides. And here, if you click on that, this is what you get. So it tells you we have kind of some general uh, resources in terms of how to use the guides, which includes uh, some pathfinders on there, like we have one on there for uh, museum professionals. Um, then the getting started guides, we'll come back to that, digital curation glossaries, which is pointing to some, um, some of the resources that are available in, in terms of charts. Um, then for the kinds of activities, so Cal showed you this a minute ago, but now you can see the list again of the um, eight different types of activities that we have used to organize these guides. And then once again, the left hand uh, navigation can help you get to this as well. So obviously these things in the center are hyperlinked, but also the, the left hand navigation is. And you can drill down as far as you want. So you can go to the top level of something like archiving websites, or if you know prepare is really where I need to start, then you can start at that. Or if you've already done some of that and you're to the store stage, you can go ahead and sit down the store. And if you chose prepare, then this is the, the page that you would see. Um, so we generally start off with a question. Remember one of these, uh, our premise is that a lot of times people getting into this work don't necessarily need to know what questions to ask to begin with. So we try to provide some of those questions for people. And then um, suggest some things. Um, you'll notice that there are a lot of action verbs in here, right? So the whole point behind this is trying to get people to do stuff. So taking action, you'll see some bullet points on all of those kinds of things. And then um, some of these review types of categories are going to be particular to a, 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 a certain source. But uh, in this case, looking at examples of various collections of, of web archiving projects to see how other people have done it and what you can learn from that. One other thing that I'll point out is we're looking at these, if you look at these little uh, block quote insets, um, these annotations were another thing that, that I suggested that we do in terms of how we can make this different from just a simple Google search. Um, so we tried to kind of help people know what they're getting into instead of just sending them off to another site, kind of helping um, uh, proof it for them, I guess, and, and help them know what's there. Then we also, like I mentioned before, we integrate uh, videos into this. So generally there is a watch section on many of these pages. And then there's always going to be a read section. And this is another kind of point that we had to figure out as we were going along, what that balance is. Because there was definitely feedback that people don't want to read too much. But at the same time, we know that, that most of this work you can't do without having to read stuff. So we tried to, uh, to pinpoint the things that we think are most valuable in this process. So the plan for these guides is that by the end of this month, the um, first uh, wave will be released. And then by the end of the academic year, the rest of them will be out. Uh, and of course, as we mentioned many times, this is an IMLS funded grant. So part of that issue is sustainability. And what's going to happen to these beyond the end of, of this grant process? So one of the, the ideas is that there's going to be, uh, beginning in the fall, there's going to be a class offered at SILS that uh, Dr. Tibo will oversee. And those students will then help to, um, to update these guides. And that could be anything as simple as making sure there's not link rot, because that's one thing I found a lot in the last 14 months is that that happens very easily. Uh, but also then it, you know, keeping track of the new things that OCLC research and other people are doing and incorporating those resources. Um, and then beyond that, what happens is part of what we're discussing today and tomorrow and beyond, um, figuring out what's going to happen in terms of maintenance or, or things that need to be added to this.